2nd of November and as you can see from the charts we're already off to a negative start for this morning. Uh, that meaning that equities on the, the back foot, we've had a gap lower in the DAX future at the open. Uh, pretty quiet actually on that initial move though on the cash open but generally we're lower in the indices uh, and a flight to quality kind of evident in the, the major asset classes i.e. Uh, we've got lower equities, higher gold, higher fixed income uh, and dollar weakness is the real um, big theme at the moment obviously big downside was seen yesterday and we're already down over a third of one percent in the dollar index this morning it was pretty quiet overnight in Asia after it got hit aggressively yesterday kind of leveled out in Asia and as soon as we've come in this morning uh, additional downside seen once again so hence you can see in my charts and top left euro dollar immediate through um, 111 up to test around R1 and then cable had a quick look at uh, R1 as well before just pulling back slightly so again follow through from yesterday is really um, the main theme of this morning so why did it happen just to quickly recap the main things from um, yesterday's session was of course political news is now and will be over the next week until election day the most market moving information that you're going to get things like the FOMC this morning we're going to talk about shortly are really a bit of a non-event uh, and economic data kind of takes a bit of a back seat something which we we're talking about yesterday uh, with the the kind of the size of reaction in ISM there certainly was one but definitely the biggest market move came on the back of this poll we had in ABC News where for the first time since May of 2016 Trump has managed to edge back in front by one point as you can see here in this graphic uh, all the way through and pretty much mid-October was when uh, the most negative news was coming out in regards to Trump we were had a clear 12 point margin that was when the market was at its most kind of confident of a of an easy win for Clinton however the game has changed significantly obviously in the wake of the FBI's new investigation into Clinton and for the first time since May Trump has taken that advantage the other point from this ABC News poll is the, the enthusiasm from supporters among likely voters and you can see here also a real sea change with among Trump supporters it's gone up uh, and Clinton's fallen substantially from 52 to 45 percent because don't forget things like these enthusiasm uh, readings are key into trying to break down expectations for the swing states or the toss-ups as they're known in the states uh, looking at those toss-up states uh, this is the real clear politics and this is a compilation of all of the national polls averaged out now I've ordered them here by status and what I'm looking at is the toss-ups because they're going to be the ones that are really going to be the most influential on the night now uh, you can see here it's a uh, going from the smallest margin all the way out but obviously it's the tighter ones we're more concerned about in particular Florida we've identified as being one of the most important given it's situated on the, the kind of southeast coast so time zone wise it's going to be one of the first to report and then also it accounts for the largest amounts of college votes in terms of 29 compared to some of the other swing states and Florida Trump is ahead by one Nevada is another swing state but actually much smaller in terms of the votes um, that it comprises of so Clinton is ahead there but looking elsewhere Iowa Trump is up 1.4 Arizona Trump is up 1.5 Clinton still leading in North Carolina Ohio remember statistically only JFK has been the the one sole president not to win Ohio ever in the history of presidential elections and still win the White House and in Ohio at this point Trump is ahead by two and a half so Clinton would need to join JFK if that were the case and materialize if the vote were to happen today according to these polls so you can see here these toss-up states which are really critical actually they're getting awfully tight and something on which Deutsche Bank 
if you read that note this morning that they were saying, and it's something which I was reading last night actually, is about the possibility of a repeat of 2000 election, where essentially, because it was so close, what can happen in terms of the legality of the process is that the basically each state, the opposition, needs to concede defeat for then the state to be um, to be won by the by the leading party. Now, the one before conceding defeat, though, they can bring a legal case against having various recounts in order to ratify the actual decision of the state. Now, in 2000, the actual result of the election was not known until a month and four days after America went to the polls. And just given how close things are becoming now, going into the final countdown, some are now starting to talk about the possibility of this happening again. And actually, we don't even know the result on the night. We have to wait a prolonged period of time for various lawyers to get involved and recounts to be conducted in order to finally know who has won. So that's just a, a new kind of spin on things. Um, not taking away, though, from the actual volatility, no doubt we'll see on the evening. The other chart, of course, is the betting odds. Although this was an unreliable in indicator for Brexit, what's quite dramatic here, you can see, is that we were looking at this, I think, a week ago today, and Clinton was up at 85%. Clinton is now 72.2%. So in terms of those odds, they're the most narrow they've been, really, since the beginning of October, albeit still the heavy favourite uh, at this point in time. How is this translating to the markets? Obviously, Monday was a very quiet day. I was talking about the DAX being one of the tightest and narrowest ranges actually we've had in a long period of time. Um, but yesterday was a lot more volatile because of this type of political news flow that was coming out, allied to some of those key economic data points in the US. Uh, one measurement of which a lot of people will look at is the VIX. It's the volatility index. For those who don't know about the VIX, it's market expectations of near-term volatility conveyed by S&P 500 stock index options and yesterday as you can see the VIX index shot up around 9% above the peak that was seen in September going into that kind of slightly ban or finely balanced Fed decision about whether or not they would hike at that point obviously they didn't and they had those dovish projections uh, but that has now moved the VIX towards what's seen psychologically as a key handle, which is 20 on the upside. When it gets above 20, that tends to equate to a state of market panic to a certain degree. And you can see the last time we were up at those levels was post-Brexit. So we're at post, well, at around aftermath of Brexit highs in the VIX. And as that starts to creep up, uh, we'll probably start to gauge more focus. Anyone interested more about the VIX? Vass is your man in terms of if you need details about how it's compiled and, and so on. Moving on, the assets then obviously when the first thing I do when I come in is I'm kind of looking at gold to a, a, a large degree to give me a, as a bellwether or a lead indicator as to market sentiment. Uh, and let me just show you the gold chart this morning. I've got it on a daily continuation. And you can see we're already up 10 bucks. You know, we've come in, state of play was a negative close in Wall Street, negative sentiment, the baton carried through into the Asian session, and then we've come in this morning and kind of carried that through. Now we're getting within $2 now back to the $1,300 handle. And if you remember, it was the break of that handle, or 1302, looking at this chart, was around September, late August, September, that provided excellent support before we rallied back up. And it was that break that caused a really powerful move to the downside. And then here we are, pretty much a month to the day, retesting back at that level. You know, if you remember, when we were down at these levels at 1250, we were talking at the time here at Amplify about the fact that given the political risks on the agenda, you know, we kind of felt that we were talking about, is this a good point to re-enter gold? down at 1250 because at that point when it was selling off a lot of question marks were would it go to 1200 which obviously brings us back down towards the uh, the pre-brexit sort of late may lows which has also acted as a good psychological barrier 
but at that point we were kind of more of the view that it's not just the US election, you've got this hard Brexit scenario, the Italian referendum, there's a lot going on uh, risk-wise, as well as obviously the Fed, uh, who still have yet to commit to pulling the trigger in December. And then ultimately we're back to, to 1300. So definitely gold is one to watch and the sort of headlines that, are, that I'm getting used to seeing in the morning as the kind of uh, the getting up to speed of what's going on, it's kind of what's gold doing and what's the peso doing tends to be the kind of the kind of play uh, and that's kind of if I show you this chart or graphic market anxiety is ticking up as the US vote approaches you can see here this is the the Bank of America Merrill Lynch's market risk index in white you can see has popped up since that new FBI reopening of the Clinton email usage uh, in that investigation and that's mapped over the Mexican peso which you can see in blue I think the, the peso ticker MX, if you wanted to look at on CQG, which has been a, a quite a good guide and ultimately will be probably one of the key assets that will be moving on the actual night itself. Uh, the other negative force, which obviously is, is weighing on equities this morning, is crude oil. So having a look back at the chart here, let me just identify the actual candle we had last night obviously with the time change the API crude oil numbers came out at half past eight or just after and this morning we've just seen a technical break of that low that was printed uh, just before the NYMEX pit closed yesterday so we just pushed down to lows printed at six cents above the 46 handle before just seeing a bit of a bounce here more recently uh, why has this occurred well this is another thing to be aware of uh, and obviously not only do you have increasing political risk but a combination of extremely bearish crude oil numbers have come out last night now looking at the numbers here I shared this with you this morning but in summary you've had a build of 9.3 million in the API crude headline last night as you can see from the graphic there that's the largest build that we've had since March earlier this year uh, Distillate saw the sixth straight week of draws, but Cushing, the other key number, saw the biggest build in three months. So certainly very bearish numbers there. And this is quite often the case of what you see in crude, is you get a kind of two-fold move. You get the actual one when it comes out, and then when Europe comes in, if it's an outlying enough number, like it was last night, you sometimes get a little look in the morning uh, as... UK and European traders digest the information. So probably another factor that might well add as a further weight to the energy and materials sector this morning. So keep an eye on those. Those DOE numbers, of course, will be coming out later on. And they'll be at half past two, not half past three. Obviously, with the US clocks still have yet to change. Some other news flow, just quickly taking you elsewhere. Uh, in the UK... UK house price growth has stalled in October, according to Nationwide Overnight. Uh, that's the first time that house price growth has stalled in 15 months, according to Nationwide. So the housing sector, certainly amid the now political risk, the fact that household goods really initiated by the MyMite um, headlines that came out, real consumer goods being affected is starting to get into the psyche of the UK consumer. We had data last week. UK consumer confidence is tracking at multi-year lows now, post actually the MyMite uh, headlines hitting the national press. People are starting to get um, a little bit more now in terms of the broader public aware of the ramifications of what this sharp depreciation of our currency is going to have on the price of everyday goods going forward. This is encapsulated then by NISA. I sent this out to you guys this morning. So NISA is an influential think tank in the UK. Remember, Mark Carney's talked about his tolerance for inflation to go above target. Target, obviously, is 2%. We're tracking at the moment in the UK inflation 1%. Still a bit of room there, but inevitably we're going to get there pretty quickly. Now, NISA have come out overnight and said that UK inflation, because of the pound, is going to go to 4%. 
4%, I would say, from what I've read in various reports, is way above what most see as consensus. When Carney says he's got tolerance, tolerance is about 3%, i.e. a whole 1% away from target and far enough that he would need to write a letter to the Chancellor explaining why it's so far away. I understand why he's done that. He's managing market expectations going forward so we don't get too fearful about this spike in inflation is going to prompt some kind of extraordinary action of an immediate nature out of the Bank of England. However, if we start getting up to 4%, this really puts the Bank of England in a tough spot. Back in August, obviously, they cut rates. They restarted QE. They've started buying corporate debt and they've started doing extra liquidity operations. All of this is a accom further accommodative monetary policy. You've now got inflation that, according to NISA, could temporarily go as high as 4%. And obviously, the last thing you want to be doing is adding to the money supply and cutting interest rates further into a currency that's ultimately more biased to the downside amid the political uh, uncertainty going forward. So definitely, this is really tomorrow. You've got Super Thursday from the Bank of England. That's when you're going to get the interest rate decision and you're going to get the quarterly inflation report. So their projections going forward for inflation, growth, and, and that will tell us what their views are for um, policy going forward as well. So certainly the UK is livening up. And if this, it's this type of development that's happening globally, but specifically more powerfully in the UK, that's causing UK yields to rally so aggressively. And as you saw yesterday in the... Deutsche Bank October summary, gilts were the worst performing asset in dollar denominated terms in the entire global product suite, if you like, uh, in the month of October. So hopefully that kind of explains a bit more reasoning of why this is occurring. Okay, let's move on to the calendar for today. Actually, this morning, uh, you've got data coming up in the next few minutes. So I'll try and quickly wrap it up. We've got the German unemployment change. Uh, you've also got the main things are ADP employment change. This is like the main, let's say, bellwether data ahead of non-farms for those to compile their estimates of how they think the official labor market report will come out. A quick look at ADP. It's been fairly consistent number. Uh, the last reading of the 154,000 um, was down, I would say, more akin to the level seen in late spring, April time. Um, so keep an eye on that when it comes out. Revision of ADP, also very important. Now, otherwise, we look ahead then on the calendar to the FOMC interest rate decision. That'll be at 6 p.m. Remember, in terms of the FOMC, it's just a statement. There's no dot plot projections. There's no Janet Yellen press conference. It's a one and done statement that comes out. Uh, and as I think Bank of America have been saying, and there's the, is the broader consensus, I actually think that this will be largely a non-event from the Fed. I think they've already been quite aggressively hawkish to the degree that they don't really need to change too much. The market is already priced at around 75% for the hike. They just need to continue uh, on track, so to speak. Uh, in terms of subtle word changes, Bank of America say that one possibility is they add the word further in front of strengthened to read that the case for an increase in federal funds rate has further strengthened. You know, it's these one word insertions into these documents that can mean a hell of a lot of difference. So for the new guys, I know it looks rather subtle, but this is what traders will be looking at. The other phrase, uh, the Bank of America suspect the Fed might want to remove is the phrase for the time being since they're getting close to delivering a hike. Uh, I did tweet this out earlier so please do take a read. I'll also pop the link into the chat if, uh, if you want to have a look yourself. Uh, okay guys so in summary got a risk off morning. I would be very mindful of any US political polls coming out. We do not know on what day or times they come out so as it was yesterday, have always half an ear on the squawk box and uh, an eye on Twitter to catch those because the market moved pretty quickly yesterday. Uh, obviously, Trump is now caught up, I would say, with pretty much even 
although one point ahead in the ABC News one. So that's your reference point, I'd say, in terms of how the market is kind of seeing this at the moment. So anything different than being tight, i.e. a more clearer Clinton or Trump lead, would ultimately cause assets to start repricing once again. So weaker dollar, major pairs trading higher at this point. Gold is up. Keep an eye on that $1,300 level, two bucks short of that at the moment. And oil, bearish numbers last night, got DOEs later. If oil comes under pressure amid the political uncertainty, I'd be looking potentially for more downside equities. Okay, guys, German data up shortly. Enjoy your day.